it wasn't the TV show and the competition that even matters. Like that's not going to be the hard part. Even if you're exercising as much as you can and dieting as hard as you can, that is not the hard part. The hard part is doing this 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, doing this for the rest of your life uh, and making it a priority. Hey everybody, Dr. Josh Axe here along with my friend Abel James. And Abel and I were just, just talking and saying I hadn't seen him in probably four years or so. Yeah. Um, man, I'm pri- I probably saw you out in California or somewhere last time, or maybe we spoke at like Paleo FX or something like that. But uh, anyways, you know, I've, I've been kind of keeping up with a little bit of what you've been doing. You've got an amazing podcast, I know. So anybody who wants to check out, it's Fat Burning Man. You can check out Abel's website and his podcast. But we're talking about a lot of different stuff today. So everybody probably knows that I live in Nashville. Abel is a musician. So not only is he a you know brilliant mind when it comes to nutrition and health, he's also uh you play the guitar, right? Yeah. There we go. And you I look, got one right I mean, here, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right now too. I mean, last time I saw you, your hair looked like mine, and now you look like a Nashville rock star. Oh, why well, thank you for saying so. But I had to. I was telling Josh before <laughs> this that I have been confused for Dr. Josh X on many occasions by people who don't know either of us that well. Oh, yeah. So I had to grow my hair out so that they don't do that anymore, especially because we're wearing the same shirt. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, look at that. But it, it works with your eyes. So I got to say, Josh. Yeah, wow. Thank you. That, that <laughs> means a lot. Appreciate it. All right, man. Well, one of the things too, it's so funny. Like I have, I've talked to some people about podcasts more recently too, because my, you know, I uh, launched my podcast not too long ago, month, month yeah, back. Yeah, congrats. But, yeah, thanks, man. But um, anyways, I was talking to somebody about, hey, what their favorite podcasts were and your name came up and they're like, there's just something about his podcast. They're like, it's his voice. I mean, not that your content's not great because it is, but you know, you've got the radio voice. And I remember even the first time we met, I'm like, this, this guy, he's got it. So again, I can see why, I mean, you're a musician too. So, so one, you've got great content. Also, you have a melodic voice. Is that, I feel like that's a compliment. That's a, that's I appreciate a you saying that, you know, I, I'll just, Kind of turn that into a health thing, though, a little bit. I grew up as a little kid playing clarinet. And so playing a, a woodwind instrument, you kind of need to learn, uh, at least playing at a certain level, you need to learn how to breathe correctly and kind of have the right posture. And then later on, I learned how to sing. And I have a deep voice, uh, as people can probably tell naturally, which means it's really hard to be heard, especially mm. in theater type type stuff, which I was doing where I wasn't mic'd, kind of growing up then as a teenager. And so it's really because I learned how to breathe and and sing that I'm able to speak this way. Because otherwise, I kind of sound like this, talking up in the nasal cavity. Yeah. And a lot of people do that now, or they kind of have they talk in the back of the throat like this and choke themselves off. And that can actually affect your physiology, how you feel about yourself, your confidence, how you show up. And so um, that, that just I want to sneak this in there too that a lot of people don't consider themselves singers or they never learn how to sing and you don't have to you know we're all humans we're all singers and so do yourself a favor and just kind of learn simple things about posture and how to project your voice and it will also save your voice over long the long haul because like i'm you probably do too i record all day and if i were speaking incorrectly without you know kind of protecting my vocal cords and making sure that i'm resonating in the right places then i would lose my voice and and i have I definitely have. And and you don't want to. It's rough. Yeah, no, it's good. Well, it reminds me of, I mean, in the way you're sharing, this is like an ancient Chinese medicine principle, you know, like things like Qigong. I mean, breathing is so important. They say when you sing or you speak, it should be coming from your depths. I mean, literally Mm -hmm. all the way down the very bottom of your diaphragm. Um, So it makes sense. Yeah. And that's one thing I do every morning and have been for five, seven years now uh, doing Qigong in the morning. And, and, practicing the breath, mostly slowing it down and making sure that it's nice and deep. And especially on days like this, it can be kind of hypey when you're talking all day and it can be easy to get ahead of yourself. So it's a nice reminder just to kind of like take, take a step back, get into the right rhythm again. And uh, <laughs> you, I think most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, especially carrying around our phones all the time with all these notifications and all these extraneous sounds, we're by default in that freaked out mode. And so it's, it's more important than ever to try to, uh, if you can, 
put that into your life, a practice of daily breathing and meditation and all that woo woo stuff that people want to rush right by because it's not like whiz bang flashy, but I'll tell you what, you do it for a while and it works. Yeah, I think it's a huge point. You know, one of the things I read too is you and your wife, uh, you know, took a, you know, have taken technology retreats. I think that's something that's so yeah. fascinating. We don't talk about enough. Talk to me about what that experience was like, how long you guys did it, and what, what did you guys notice? I love that question. And it's happened a few times. The first time it happened was when we were living, this was years ago in Austin, Texas, and uh, pretty much everything in life was cruising. We were feeling good, but like empty at the same time. And so it was uh, just after sundown and whoosh, the power goes out. Everything, not a light is on in the whole neighborhood. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we kind of like, our, we let our eyes adjust. We're like, oh, this is weird. And it actually stayed out for, for a while without power. And we're like, oh my God, like, this place is awesome. We could hear the birds singing. We, uh, we're much more tuned in to the environment and chilled it out. It was a lot easier to sleep that night. We're like, man, you know, just because this is progress and technology is moving forward and it's everywhere now, that doesn't mean that we need to participate in that. And, um, all the time. Anyway, I think it is important to connect with people, obviously, but doing that all the time might not be doing anyone a service, especially when burnout is such a real thing that almost everyone is struggling with now. So giving yourself a chance to step back from from your phone as if it were still tri- you know, tethered to the wall. You and I grew up in the generation before smartphones had really taken over. Yeah. And so we were, when we left the house to go meet up with friends or just leave or whatever, we were leaving the phone, we were leaving the computers, we were leaving everything. And I think that's, that's something that I've always held sacred, especially as uh, someone who writes and, uh, and creates music and does other artistic things. Like every time you're interrupted when you're in a deep state of flow, it steals your soul a little bit, right? It, it, it's so much harder to get back to that place. Um, so being able to, to get away from all of that and then tune in hopefully to nature, that's something that, that we try to do. Going out in the woods for a hike or just hanging out on the deck somewhere or just being out by the water and watching it. Trying to build that in as a practice is like, uh, it is something that once you start doing it, you, you realize its value. But before you do, you'd be like, why would I ever do that? It's, it's a weird thing like that. Well, I love that too. You know, I was talking to someone recently too about, uh, you, you may have seen the studies in, in Japan, but they've done this, I mean, really long period study on forest bathing. Yes. And it, I mean, so incredible. And I, I mean, all of us have experienced, it's like some people in order for them to be convinced that what you and I are talking about and not think it's, as you were saying, you're all this foo foo weird thing, but it's, you know, they have to see this study, but in, you know, Japan, they did this 10 year study on forest bathing and, uh, but so much of it is due to these sounds and you were, it made me think yes. of it because you were talking about you and your wife, Allison, you were hearing the bird, you know, you were hearing the chirping, you were hearing those noises. And these are these theta waves, you know, that really allow us to get in the zone of kind of like meditation, relaxation. And I know, you know, as you mentioned, like before we were talking, you said you live about four hours outside of Denver. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you guys do when you can't, like, what do you eat? What do you bring? Cause I know, I mean, you're so into natural health, you're ripped. There's a reason why people call you fat burning man. So t- tell me about that. Like, what is a camping trip like with the, you know, James family? Do you guys bring any superfoods? Do you guys, you know, what's, what, what's that like? Yeah, we do. And we try to, in some ways live like we can't, but it's a lot easier to do that when you're out in the woods and bring some of those principles back to your daily life. Mostly mm-hmm. in, the, in, I'll tell you kind of what we learned, <laughs> that you've got to be prepared, you've got to plan ahead and bring the food and the meals or the raw materials that you'll want um, to work on or work with throughout however long you're, you're out there. So what I mean by that is like hit up the grocery store instead of restaurants. Go to the places where you can actually buy the ingredients for food so that you, you can make food later instead of just kind of, you know, grabbing a meal and then you go out camping, and you don't have anything and you have to figure it out or you have to like look up a restaurant, then go out there. That's um, sure that can be a vacation. Definitely. And there's something to be said for that. But if you're really going out there and camping, <laughs> I've said this before on my show many times, but I stand by it. The best meal I've ever had in my life is a dehydrated bean burrito after we'd been on like a week long backpack, backpacking hike. And we had like one of my friends bought a thing of Cabot 
cheese that was like this big and oh, it was just man. the best thing we had ever had because especially when you're out there for a while and you haven't really been eating three square meals a day and you haven't seen cooked food in a while if you just warm something up over the fire and it's uh it's the only thing you've had in a while it's life-changing and you can't help but bring like i said a little bit of that back with you to the dinner table so like when we're out hiking for most of the day we're not eating those typical meals. You're really just by default tuned in and thankful for whatever you're eating, even if it's a you know greasy dehydrated bean burrito, which I wouldn't touch in the normal world. That's not something that I would normally eat. But when you simplify and you tune into nature, you realize that all of this is not quite so complicated as everyone makes it out to be. And we don't need quite as much food and stimulation and and entertainment and all this other stuff that just comes from all the billboards and all the ads and all the notifications when you're living in this default world. So what I think it brings more than anything else is a, a simple bit of mindfulness to, you know, the way that we do it is Austin is an amazing cook. I cook here and there, but she does most of the cooking and I like making the drinks, whether it be coffees, teas, or, or whatever else. And so it's a lot easier to be thankful for it, focused on it, and psyched about it when it's like the only thing you're doing. That's your only entertainment is making tea for your wife, yeah. right? And then drinking it together and then like listening to the birds and stuff. And it sounds super lame from the outside in. You really have to get out there, shake the city off for a little while to realize why that's so powerful. It's so good, man. I just, uh, I'm with you. I've camped just a few times over the years. And um, when I was a kid, we camped all the time. Like my family, we were like, we used to go to Disney, but we always, um, we always camped and, or for, or my parents for a little while had a, had a motor home, but man, I, I mean, just mm -hmm. loved it. And there was something, yeah. you're right. There's something that's so peaceful about not having technology, just allowing your, you know, your adrenals and, you know, this fight or flight state just to sort of calm down. I want to tell you yeah. just a quick one minute side story of this wasn't the last time I camped, but Right before I, when I, before I opened up my functional medicine clinic in Nashville, I said, I want to do a retreat and kind of like spiritual health, fasting. And at the time, I was living down in Naples, Florida, where I was uh, doing an internship. Okay. And I looked up, hey, where's the, closest, uh, where's the closest state park? And it was the Everglades. And so I drove wow. over and I'm like, I'm going to do this like great camping trip. I got all my stuff. And it turns out it was like 85 degrees, 100% humidity. <laughs> And I didn't have food and I made it not even quite a day and the mosquitoes yeah. in the, ever oh. I don't know what I was thinking. It was probably the most miserable 24. <laughs> so anyways, that was my, uh, don't, don't, I mean, don't go camping in the Everglades, you know, just outside of summer. It's not, not ideal. You might get eaten by giant man eating snakes there too. No, it's, it's out of hand. That, so that just lends itself to, you got to be prepared, right? You got to know where you're going. And this is, especially where we are now, we live at 8,000 feet looking at 14,000 foot mountains. Wow. And there are stories that come in. Sometimes you see the, you know, military helicopters go over because people get lost up there. They lose the trail. They can't get back. This just happened recently. And a, a man fortunately made it back, but he lost his feet because he was so frostbitten. And so, if you don't bring the right equipment or you don't bring the right food or whatever, it's sometimes it's kind of silly and just like a disaster or whatever, but other times it's like a, a survival scenario. So that's a, that's a good point too. Like if it is going to be really hot or really cold or elevation or really dry or whatever, you, you've got to be prepared, but it takes practice. It takes education. And also I'll say like when you first get out there and you're used to being in that go, go, go type A personality, let's get everything done mode. You don't like camping at first. I don't like camping at first. It's like, it takes me a day or two to be like, why, why am I here? I don't, I don't like this. I feel like I should be doing something right now. And then like after a couple of days, you're like, oh God, this is the best. <laughs> oh yeah. That's awesome. It, if you know how to deal with the mosquitoes, that is. That and, is and right. Come to Colorado. It's a lot better most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, you guys definitely have a better, better climate. Chelsea was just, she was out in Denver not too long ago. She was doing something with like Oxygen Magazine. And we've been out there a few times. And I just, what, what, a, what a great and beautiful area. I was in Salt Lake not too long ago. But we know out west there is just, oh, uh, yeah. man, it is great. So I was going to ask you about a few other things. One, you know, I... I think I was watching something on TV not long ago and you were on this like ABC yeah. reality TV. And I'm like, what, you know, there, there, <laughs> there, there's Abel here doing his thing and coaching some people up. So tell me about what was that experience like? And 
And what was, um, what was that challenge like? What were you able to, what, what were some of the results people were able to see? I'd love, love for you to talk about that. Yeah. What an experience that was. So that's going back to, it was filmed at the very end of 2015 and then aired 2016 uh, for like the new year. And the premise of the show, long story short, was uh, it was a fitness and weight loss and fat loss competition that went over uh, the course of a few months and basically you had five coaches that are partnered up coaching one person each and kind of the twist of the show is that the people who were being coached who had the weight to lose who wanted to get in shape or get their health back could fire their coaches like every week the coaches are on the chopping block and if they didn't like the coach if they didn't like the way that they're eating or, or working out or if they weren't getting results it's like every week you might be gone and so that did make it really interesting. And as a coach, it made it extremely frightening. Wow. When I got my dude, Kurt Morgan, uh, you know, he's, he's from Georgia. He was coming up on like 50 years old and extremely overweight, had been for a long time. He was actually in a serious car accident years before, was basically on his deathbed with sepsis. I got his, his list of medical conditions. It was over four pages long at the beginning. And um, not only that, he had spinal issues where he was, it's, it's another long story, but he wasn't really able to do a whole lot of working out or heavy lifting or anything like that. Um, and certainly not much, much running and cardio and stuff that would be hard on the knees because he was a really tall dude as well. So um, anyway, I started coaching him the other uh, coaches were doing their thing. We had a a vegan, a vegan coach, uh, someone who was doing kind of just like low calorie stuff. And then a few other people who got cycled in and out and fired immediately. Like the vegan was gone pretty much immediately. And then uh, my dude lost, and I can't remember all the numbers off the top of my head anymore, but I think it was 15 pounds the first week, 11 pounds the second week, and then at a steady around like seven pound a week clip. Now, normally, that is not something that I would encourage. Um, this was kind of like, for him, he felt like he wasn't going to get himself out of this low state of health and this kind of rock bottom state without doing something super extreme and serious. And for him, as overweight as he was with, I think he started at 52% body fat. Um, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you don't want to lose weight as quickly as possible, but with you and your health conditions, if, you, if you're up for it, I'll help you lose your yeah. fat as quickly as possible because it's a massive risk, especially at your age and, and with the type of fat that he had kind of throughout his body surrounding his organs. So anyway, over the course of the next eight and then uh, 14 weeks, he lost the most body fat, 70, uh, let's see, 87 pounds and I think around four months. Wow. And, uh, his, his goal at the beginning, he'd always wanted to go rock climbing. But being that weight, they don't let you. And so he wanted to get below the weight where he couldn't. By the end of the show, he was up there rock climbing. Oh my! And gosh. I was just like so psyched. And I got to know him so well. He's still a friend to this day. And he's helped me through some things. And uh, it's just so cool because normally, you know, I, I've been a coach um, working with people from afar. Sometimes I do it in person. But like we were practically living together on that show and really went through something together. But interestingly, because it was an ABC show um, and, and kind of the way that they set up the whole reality show scenario, they awarded the number one spot to somebody else who lost more fat and muscle. <laughs> well, okay, she didn't lose more fat. She <laughs> lost more weight and muscle is yeah. where that mostly came from. She lost some fat. Whereas Kurt lost by far the most fat, but just because of like those little things, they wanted to make someone else win and see how that went. So mm -hmm. it was definitely, definitely a reality show, but being on a reality show as like the politics become a, a very much a reality show was, was a definite head trip. So that was a whole thing too. <laughs> Yeah, we have some friends who are, and actually, it, you'd be shocked at how many bachelors and bachelorettes who have been on that show live in Nashville. I mean, it's like they get done with the oh, show. Oh, yeah. Nashville's here. awesome. It makes sense. It, it is, man. It's a great spot. But some of our friends are uh, just connected to a lot of those people. And so talking to them, in fact, they had some filmmakers come over who were going to do a reality TV show about them as well, too. And just hearing, you're like, it's definitely 
more TV show than it is actual reality. Yeah, yeah, but it's crazy. <laughs> That's kind of how it works. That was that was a very interesting lesson that I kind of knew going into it that it's definitely more TV show than it is reality. But once you're on one of those things, you, you have no idea the extent of how much that's true. That's it's crazy. really bizarre actually, but it, it makes me more and more thankful to that you're starting up this podcast and getting that going that I have the platform to be able to have yep. my own show and have people like you on who hopefully we can have long form conversations with an open mind and talk about how to work through these issues instead of the closed down kind of usually top down narrative type re reality show where the most you ever get is a sound bite or two that they take yeah. out of context and then try to attack you know oh, yeah if we're looking for solutions we've got to have people like you doing long form and really trying to help people so kudos to you for getting this going because it's a lot of work thanks Abel. it is sure you no know. it is well one of the things i'll say i mean if if, if everybody thinks about this losing 87 pounds in you know in four months, that's losing a small person. I mean, that is so yeah. much weight. I mean, I think about if I'm lifting up a, you know, an 87 pound barbell of weight, I mean, that is so much weight for somebody to lose. Yeah. Share with me, what, what were some of the biggest things you did compared to other competitors? Because as you shared, you had everybody else who, maybe, maybe they lost some weight, a lot of people mm -hmm. didn't lose near as much weight, but the bigger thing is your person, their body transformed, they lost body fat, got more fit, I also know with working with you, they had a better outlook on life. Like what were your strategies? What were they eating? Like I'd love to hear every yeah. detail about what, what you had Kurt doing. Yeah. So Kurt, like I said, he was psyched and wanted to get strict from the beginning. And with most people, I don't get that strict because I mm. find it's, it's more about, this is a marathon. This is something that is more a lifestyle and you need to find a way to like it and do it yourself without someone there. And I was never the type of like angry trainer that was you know, breathing down his throat. I'm like, this is on you, dude. If you want to do it, like this is a stupid reality show. I'm not really getting paid for this. I don't care. Like this is for you. And so some of the other coaches were pretty rough on, on their contestants where they'd be like literally camping outside their houses, waking them out up in the morning and just kind of like hassling them all the time to work out. Where uh, for me, at least in my experience and with the people I've coached, I find so much more success going with the nutrition and diet side than the over exercise side of things and that's usually over encouraged especially on tv you know it's just like eat less and exercise more that's totally going to work and you're going to lose all, all your weight not that that can't work but i find once again it's it's easier to focus on kind of the quick wins where you're going to like this and you're going to stick with it so with someone like kurt you know coming up on 50 years old and works real hard big dude loves food. I'm not going to be shoveling green smoothies and salads down his throat. That's not how this is going to work. And, and I kind of just like taught, we negotiated at the beginning and we're kind of just like, all right, how, how's this going to go down? Um, but I really love quality food that's cooked at home. And so first we went shopping together and we loaded up on clean grass-fed pasture-raised meats. So we made sure that he had a high quality source of protein and fat that was available for him to prepare or his wife to prepare uh, or to, for me and my wife to help him prepare sometimes. That was just there for him, ready to go. Sometimes frozen, like I ordered, uh, geez, I think it was 300 pounds of pasture-raised, uh, $300 worth, excuse me, $300 worth of pasture-raised um, poultry. We got wild-caught fish and uh, beef and bison for him to work through in the next few months. So we got excited about the food from the beginning. It's just like, look at all this cool stuff we'll be putting together. We made avocado bacon burgers together and went bunless. We had no processed sugars or flours or carbs, especially at the beginning. There was none of that, but it was quite indulgent. Um, we had chocolate we would uh make so my wife allison and i we love making real food desserts and and treats and so that was a big part of it too where we would make a pumpkin pie and he would have a slice of it and he's just like what like i can i can really eat this and it's gonna work and it's like we'll see man and so you know like first week 15 pounds and 11 pounds and seven pounds and so the other contestants who are just like eating salad and working out all the time or <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, two, <laughs> two little baby carrots for breakfast and then running 10 miles or whatever. And they're seeing him like backstage, like eating pumpkin pie and like having chicken Parmesan, which is another one where we make instead of uh, the noodles, which are super high in carbs and a lot of times high glycemic if they're made from processed wheat or other grains, we would make zoodles with zucchini or make something else with veg as the main part of uh, the, the most volume of what he was eating. And then he would get the, the savory satisfaction of getting the fatty bit of protein that was prepared nicely, simply, but quite nicely. And then a small treat after that. And for him, that was enough. So combined with that, was time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting. So for someone like Kurt, big dude yeah. uh, with a lot of weight to lose, he found that after a few days, he, he liked fasting and he could get out of that sudden, you know, just craving stuff all day long mode that he'd been in for years, really, just kind of constantly so, feeding. So, so it sounds too like, I mean, really you had him sort of combine a very healthy version of keto with, with intermittent fasting. Yes, too. yeah, but I... One thing that was critically important is that we never sacrificed vegetables yeah. to reduce carbs, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, like, so important. Especially the green veg, that was something where I'm like, all right, if you're going to eat your meats, here's the deal. You've got to make sure that you get some veg going on to alkalize all of this and not just, you, you, your palate will get tired of eating a bunch of meat if you try to do it that way or a bunch of fat if you try to do it that way for too long. I, you know, that can work for some people. And as an intervention for something like managing seizures, like absolutely go for it. But for a lifestyle, I think it's really important to make sure that you do get that balance and that that's what you're learning from day one. You're mm -hmm. learning the balance and how to love this, not that one food is perfect or that one macronutrient is the enemy. Um, but if there is one that's the enemy, it's, it's probably sugar. You got to yeah. be really careful with that. Oh yeah. That's no, so good, man. Well, I love, I mean, the diet sounds, Again, pumpkin pie sounds pretty good to me. Dark chocolate sounds pretty good to me. Par chicken Parmesan sounds pretty great. So, and, and, and the funny thing is, like I'm thinking about this, I'm like, you hardly changed your diet. This is kind of like the way you, are, you and Allison already ate. For him, yeah, it was exactly. like a radical change. Yeah. Yeah, which is interesting, right? That that's what Allison and I have been doing for, for years at this point. And like when Kurt and his wife, Alicia first met us, they, they like took a look at me and Allison and they're like, this is way too good to be true. <laughs> I mean, this, there's no, these people are totally on a reality show. There's no way this is true. Uh, but it took, it was really that first week when he stepped on the scale. Um, and he looked at the number and we won, we won like the fitness competition, number one in the fitness competition, number one in the way in like week after week after week. And, um, then he just, kind of became this was another really cool thing that happened is he i watched him become like more zen mm. it's a super high intensity thing where you're taking your shirt off being half naked being weighed in front of america with millions of people watching forever right in front of sean t you know who is who is the host of the show and me just like putting yourself out there but and also, since it was a reality show, they would kind of stage these fights, right? Where they would attack him and he would then try to make him lose it and go nuts. But as he changed his way of eating, he started to change his way of thinking and, and got a little bit more zen and laid back and could handle the attacks. And you could tell that his, not that he had temper or short fuse or anything, but it got better. He, he got more patience. He could put up more of a fight and had more energy as time went on. And that was just so cool to see that you could take someone from being so sick to, you know, also being all off of his meds by the end of it. Okay. Can I tell you what's so amazing? I mean, there's so many things amazing about it, but one, it's like he lost weight, which because of that, and he got healthier. And when yeah. you feel better, think about what that does to your physiology. Like if you don't get a good night's sleep and you ate, you know, or somebody had a hangover, somebody ate, you know, 10 times too many carbs they should. The next day, you're more, you know, you're more irritable, you're mm -hmm. more cranky, you're not as kind to people, you're not as loving. Like, so literally, I mean, what you were able to do is help this person look better, which is going to help their self esteem tremendously. Sure. More peace in their life, more energy. I mean, I, I used to have a mentor who always said this to me. He said, if you're able to get in, this guy had a really successful clinic and help people get healthy. And he said, if you're able to actually help somebody get healthy, he's like, what you're able to save them in their health bills, in their relationships. He, he pointed out the number one cause of divorce rates in the, in the United States today 
is medical bills. Yeah. And the number one cause of medical bills, of course, is people not living a healthy lifestyle. So what you can do for somebody's wealth, their health, their relationships together, it's just, it's powerful, man. I love it. That was another piece too. His medical bills, partially because of the car accident and, and the fallout, were over a million dollars oh my before gosh. I worked with him. And since he had really good insurance and a good job, it's like he could deal with it and kind of cover it. But a million dollars. That was, you know, it was really powerful to me and opened my heart in a big way, being up close and personal and really getting to know and love this man and his family because he was really in a, in a rough spot. Well, hey, well, let me ask this too, because it makes me think of this. So, I mean, obviously if somebody loses 17 pounds in a week or two weeks or whatever that first weigh in, they're going to be motivated. You yeah. know, but I'm sure sometime during that entire process, it, you know, he was ready to quit. Like, did, 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 yeah. did you have that time? And like, what did you say to him? Like, were the, you know, during those times, like what? I try to approach this from the mind more than the body and, and from psychology more than anything else. And for him, from day one, I told him, this is on you. If you want to do it, you're the one who's responsible to do the day-to-day -day work, but you're the one who also gets all the results out of this. You know what I mean? I'm just here kind of passing this on because I was never as sick as him, but I was sick. And when I was at rock bottom, I needed help that wasn't quite there. And so like, I'm thankful that he gave me permission to be there to help because that's, that's extremely important. But it was always more about mindset than about like grinding because I told him, you know, yeah. it, it wasn't the TV show and the competition that even matters. Like that's not going to be the hard part. Even if you're exercising as much as you can and dieting as hard as you can, that is not the hard part. The hard part is doing this 10 years from now, 20 mm -hmm. years from now, 30 years from now, doing this for the rest of your life uh, and making it a priority. And so I was just really clear with them that I wasn't going to nag, that I wasn't going to like be there all the time watching him or have any sort of hierarchical type thing. He's older than me. He's senior to me. He's like a foot taller than me. <laughs> I look like a tiny little miniature man next to this oh. dude. And so I, I want to be very careful to say like, you are your own person. You are your own guru. And I am here to help based on yeah. the experience that I have. But that's as far as it goes. It's all on you. Man, there's so many things I love about that. I'm reading, a, my wife and I are reading a good book right now. It's called, uh, keep your love on. And the entire book though is about how people will essentially kind of turn, turn, turn their love off towards people, stop mm -hmm. accepting love the right way. But they, he's kind of starts off the book saying, you have a choice between being a powerful person and a not powerful person. It's, they said, just because you've had something bad happen to you in your life, like that doesn't keep you from being powerful. Powerful is, is saying, I'm making a decision, a choice today to keep with this diet. I'm making a choice today to love people. Love is a choice. It's not a feeling and going through that. But anyway, it just made me think about that. That's part of essentially what you, like you know, one of the first words you said was choice. Like Abel James is, or you know, you're not doing this. You have the choice, you have the power. So anyways, I just, it made me think of that too. That's, it's, yeah, uh, that's cool. It's powerful stuff. Cause this is going to affect the way he, you know, deals with things in 10 years, you know, and yeah. not just diet, but also other hard decisions in life. It's that's awesome. Totally. Yeah. Cause part of it was going through losing weight over those weeks, but oh, and getting his health back. But also we were going through something together where we were, we were being like kind of psychologically attacked and abused on the set of a reality show together, yeah. going through that together. And so like we're brothers because of that forever. You know what I mean? So there are different elements at play, but I think you need to really harness those and to the extent possible say we are in this together, not like this is my fight or this is your fight. Or, you know, sometimes he would go off a little bit and eat some things that he wasn't supposed to. I mean, this yeah. four months through the holidays, you know, surrounded by work friends, parties, his son um, uh, got married during that and he wanted to drink and have some apple cider and stuff like this. And I'm just like, all right, all right. <laughs> and so, you know, there, there definitely were many ups and downs, but um, it was more of a partnership than anything else. And, I, and that's kind of the way I think it has to be, at least for me, because this isn't, it was really outside of my comfort zone. You know, that's not really what I do. Um, but I'm real, really glad that I got to do it because I learned so much about how this can work. But even more so, the testament of watching someone go from that state of being that sick 
just the look in his eyes. And, you know, you can tell when people are, when, when their heart's not strong or where they're not getting enough circulation or something, it's just like, they look closer to death than life. And then seeing him at the end of that, just kind of like beaming, looking 20 years younger. It just, it melts me. You know, when I'm off camera, it re <laughs> I really let it oh, yeah. affect me. And it does. I love it. Let, let, let's talk now because again, we were talking about on the show, we were talking about on this reality show, this is kind of the way you and Allison ate. So tell yeah. me though, like, to, you know, d day to day and where you're at now in Colorado, like what, what, what is your guys, what is your routine? Like, what is your, what, what do you do in the morning after? Like, what, what is your typical, what, what do your days look like? Yeah. So I am a fan of time restricted eating and I've been eating one or one and a half meals a day, most days for many years now, almost a decade now. Wow. Um, now my wife um, does do some intermittent fasting, but she'll eat more often than me and usually a little bit earlier and smaller quantities at a time, a little bit more of a grazing pattern. And the way that, so what we eat is very similar. I'll eat a little bit more and less often, but what one thing that's super important that we consider, and I know you're a fan of collagen, is uh, making sure that the first thing that hits your belly and that hits your, your taste buds in your mouth isn't high glycemic, isn't sugary, isn't going to set you off on a binge. It's instead the other side of that. It's something like a collagen rich bone broth mm. or a big salad of veg or a green smoothie or you know a low glycemic, low sugar green juice of some kind. It's something that's going to kind of ease you in to eating. And if you're eating nuts. They're not the kind that have been deep fried and then covered in MSG and a bunch of salt and, and whatever else they want to throw on there. It's something that kind of like eases you into the feeding state once again, if that makes sense. Yeah. So starting with something that, that's easy on the belly and on digestion seems to really serve us. And so we'll start with that with maybe bone broth or a fiber heavy uh, and phytonutrient heavy, something that has veg in it could be cooked, could be a green smoothie, could be a salad. And then generally we'll have one larger cooked meal a day and that'll be dinner. And we'll have it more on the earlier side than the late side. We tend to go to bed following the sun as much as we can. So a little, a little bit after sundown. Uh, so anyway, we have that nice little feast that we prepare at home almost all of the time. And then Usually we'll have a little treat that's also homemade after that. And so when we make treats, we try to make them without processed grains, without processed sugars, without artificial nonsense. And after doing this for a while, we don't need as much sweetness baked uh -huh. into all of our foods. So we try to keep get away with as little sweetness as possible. So like in the pumpkin pie, we've got a couple in the fridge right now. And I've been eating a slice or two pretty much every night because it's made mostly with pumpkin eggs, nuts, you know, which make up the crust as well as part of the insides and, and not too much sugar, but you get the flavor of sugar from, uh, we'll use blackstrap molasses, just a mm. tablespoon or two. Same thing with maple syrup sometimes. And then sometimes we'll cut that with stevia or monk fruit or some yep. of the sweeteners that are basically non-caloric to give it a little more of a sweet punch without the calories and the high glycemic stuff that comes along with the syrups. So you can get, you can get creative with it and you can also get away with eating some really tasty treats, even desserts. If you make them at home, you know what's in them. And obviously you don't go cra crazy with it because it's a personality type thing too. Some people can moderate better than others. I love it, man. In fact, you just listed probably my favorite dessert and it's pumpkin pie. So anytime oh, holidays do roll hard around. to beat. <laughs> oh man. And, and literally we, Chelsea, this, you know, past holidays made a pumpkin pie and I had her do, it was Manuka honey, monk fruit and a little molasses. And it was just nice. a little bit, just enough yeah. and then lots of pumpkin pie spice, you know? And, yep. uh, so similar, but yeah, man, it doesn't, and I, I, that's a good thing too, starting off the morning without the sweetness. I mean, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of times when you start your morning off with something sugary and sweet, your body later on is like, I need more of that. And so yeah. it's, uh, it, it's brilliant. I think there's something to be said too. I found that men and women, a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I believe everybody's different, wired differently. And, and so I've, I've found a lot of times women um, sometimes don't do as well with intermittent fasting and do right. better with eating more meals spread out as well. So it makes sense. I have a last question for you. So this is a little bit of a challenging question, but 
if everybody listening or everybody in the world could get one thing and grasp one concept that they would apply, what would you have it be? What, what is that one thing that you're like, if people could get this, it would change the game for, for their health, their mind, what, what, whatever, you know, whatever you think. Balance. If you can get balance in how you're eating, how you're moving, how you're living, then you'll always have the tools to navigate whatever's thrown at you in the future. And so as a part of balance, I see kind of the opposite, which is diversity, right? You want to you be cycling what you're eating with the seasons, uh, getting a wide diversity of plant and animal foods so that you're not just kind of stacking on the same foods over and over again. So part of that balance too means, I think, getting the balance of feeding states and not feeding states, right? So when you're fasting and you're restricting the time that you're eating, you're giving your body a break from food is one way to look at it. Um, and when you're eating, you're giving your body a break from fasting. You know, you're giving your body a, a rest in a different way, but cycling back and forth and balancing those is really the trick. Like you said, it's harder to do fasting and make that like a critical part of what you're doing if you're a woman, especially a, a woman in certain parts of her life, like around pregnancy, mm -hmm. or if you're raising kids and breastfeeding, like you, you need to constantly adjust and do what works for you. And that, that's always going to be a moving target. So if you can focus on balance, I know it sounds a little squishy, but the answer is always going to be a little squishy, you know, because you've, oh, yeah. you've got to stay on it and you've got to stay focused and adapt. I love it. That's great. Great advice. Well, hey, I want to encourage everybody, check out Abel's podcast. It's Fat Burning Man. Also, his website, Fat Burning Man. He's got some amazing content. By the way, a little bit about his podcast. It's been ranked the number one podcast in health in eight different countries for five years in a row. He's won, won multiple awards with it. He's also got a great book called The Wild Diet. So again, it's The Wild Diet. Uh, and so I want to say, Abel, man, good catching up. I know it's been a while, but... Uh, Man, glad to see you uh, just doing so well. And uh, man, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom today on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for listening. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. 